In this video we're going to discuss angles, some of the concepts associated with angles and the different ways we can measure them. So trigonometry is all about triangles, specifically how the angles in a triangle relate to the different sides of the triangle. So having a foundational understanding of angles is going to be important. So first off, let's start with defining an angle. So formally speaking, what is an angle? Well, an angle is formed by rotating a ray, which is just a half line. So it's a, it's a structure that continues infinitely in one direction and then has a terminating endpoint. So it, we rotate a ray about its end point, forming a second ray wherever we stop our rotation. So the angle represents the rotation we make when we take this ray and then rotate it and then draw the new ray where, wherever we stop rotating. So the starting position for our angle is what we call the initial side of the angle. And then the final position where we draw the new ray is called the terminal side of the angle. It's where it terminates. And then this common endpoint where we're rotating is called the vertex of the angle. Now most of the angles we look at are going to be in standard position or we're going to prefer angles that are in standard position. So an angle is in standard position as long as the vertex is placed at the origin in the xy coordinate plane and the initial side is positioned along the positive x axis. So in other words, as we rotate, we're rotating counterclockwise starting from the positive x axis with our vertex on the origin. Now one of the major things we're going to be interested in is the measure of an angle. So the measure of an angle descri describes the direction and the amount of rotation to go from the angle's initial side to its terminal side. Now measure may be expressed in degrees, which you're probably familiar with or this new measure type that you may not be familiar with called radians. So we're going to look at angles measured using both techniques. Some techniques will be preferred um, or some measure descriptions, measured varieties are going to be preferred over others just depending on the situation we're in, but we're going to talk about how you convert between both of these um, units. So degrees versus radians, let's define each of these, talk a little bit about them. So degrees, again, what you're familiar with, formally speaking, one degree represents one 360th of a full rotation. So if you imagine taking a circle or alternatively just taking the coordinate plane and dividing it into 360 equal pieces in terms of rotation, one degree represents one of those 360 pieces. Now we can talk about degrees in a couple of different ways. We can talk about degrees and then decimal degrees, fractions of degrees, or we can talk about smaller units within degrees. So from a degree, one unit within deg a degree is what we call a minute. So one minute represents one sixtieth of a degree. So if you take a degree, one out of those 360 parts in your circle, and break it down into 60 more parts. Well, one of those 60 parts is what we call a minute, and then you can break a minute down further into what we call seconds, not surprisingly. So one second is gonna be 1 60th of a minute, or if you then wanted to relate it to degrees, if it's 1 60th of a minute, and then a minute is 1 60th of a degree, then that would be one out of 3600 degrees. So 60 times 60 giving us 3600. So when we write degree measures, we can either use degree minute second form expressing some type of rotation in terms of how many degrees, how many minutes, and how many seconds are represented by that amount of rotation, or we can use decimal degrees which means we're going to include the full degree amount and then rather than writing minutes and seconds as the fraction of degrees, we'll just write the degree amount and then a decimal representing the additional portion of a degree that's represented. 
So let's talk about how we would convert between decimal degrees and then degree, minute, second form, and then vice versa. So suppose we have degree, minute, second form. We want to convert to decimal degrees. So these are going to be our notations. So the degree symbol you're probably familiar with. And then one prime symbol represents a minute. And then two primes represents a second. So we want to convert this angle, which is 74 degrees plus a little bit, you can think of it that way, to decimal degrees. Well, the degree portion will be part of the decimal degree form. So we have 74 full degrees. So we're going to include that part just by itself. What we ultimately want to do, though, is convert the minutes and the seconds to some fraction of a degree rather than full minutes and full seconds. So 42 minutes, we want to convert that to degrees. So one minute is one out of 60 of a degree. So we're gonna multiply by a conversion factor that's going to take minutes and convert it to degrees. So this says there's one degree for every 60 minutes. So that means there is one degree for every 60 minutes. Whenever we use a conversion factor, we always want to use the factors version where we're going to have matching units that are going to cancel diagonally. And then the unit we want to keep, in this case we want to convert to degrees, is going to be in the numerator. So in this way, these two units that we want to get rid of are going to cancel diagonally. So that's going to give us 42 out of 60 degrees and if we do that division, we want to do decimal degrees, so we want an actual decimal. That's going to be 42 divided by 60, and that's going to be 0 0.7. So we didn't even need approximately, but that's going to be 0 0.7 degrees. Okay, so we're going to add that portion to our 74 full degrees. Now we also need to convert our seconds so 15 seconds. Now we can either convert directly to degrees or we can convert to minutes and then convert to degrees from there. So it's really up to you. I would argue that maybe it's easier to convert to minutes and then to degrees so that we end up using the same conversion factor every time. So if we want to convert our seconds to minutes, well there's going to be one minute for every 60 seconds. And then there's going to be one degree for every 60 minutes. So notice seconds will cancel diagonally, minutes will cancel diagonally, and we'll be left with the unit we want, which is going to be degrees. So if we were to simplify that down, write that as a simplified rational expression, our units, of course, are going to cancel. We're going to be left with 15 in the numerator, and then 60 times 60 which is 3,600 in the denominator. So that's how many degrees we have now. So let's see what that's going to be. So 15 divided by 3,600 is going to give us this much, this portion. And this, of course, we can approximate if we'd like. So 0, 0.00, and then I'll just round off to 4, 2, degrees. So when we convert to decimal degrees, again we have 74 full degrees and these fractions of degrees. So we have 74 degrees plus 7 tenths of a degree plus that many additional degrees. And if we add those together, so 74 plus 0 0.7 plus 0 0.0042 and that's going to give us how many degrees we have. So this would be the rough approximation of this many degrees minute seconds converted to decimal degrees. And we always want to make sure we use the appropriate symbols to indicate the type of notation, the type of unit we're talking about, particularly since we're going to use both degrees and radians. And then within the category of degrees, we're talking about degrees, minutes, seconds, or decimal degrees. 
having the notation for units is going to be very important. So make sure you get in the habit of putting your units every single time so we know exactly what we're talking about each time we look at an angle measure. Okay, now let's go the other way. So what if we have decimal degrees and we want to convert to degree, minute, second form? Well, again, the full amount of degrees, that truly is going to be the amount of degrees. What we're interested in is this fraction, this 0.26 degrees left over, what's that converted to minutes and to seconds, to fractions of a degree? So we're going to have 159 degrees, and then 0 0.26 degrees, we now want to convert to minutes. Well, if there's one degree for every 60 minutes, then there's going to be 60 minutes for every one degree. So notice I flipped the conversion factor because now I want to eliminate degrees and I want to keep minutes. So I'm going to do that multiplication and notice the unit I'm going to be kept that I'm going to keep is going to be minutes. So 0 0.26 and then I'm multiplying by 60. And that's going to give me 15.6 minutes. Now because I don't want fractional amounts, this is going to be the total number of minutes. And then 0.6, some fraction of a minute, that is then going to be converted to seconds. So we're only going to keep the 15 minutes and then the 0.6 minutes, so 0 0.6 minutes, will then convert to seconds. Well, if there's one minute for every 60 seconds, then there's going to be 60 seconds for every one minute. Again, we flipped the conversion factor. Minutes will be eliminated and we'll keep seconds. So again, we're going to do that multiplication. So 0 0.6 times 60 is going to give us 36, so 36 seconds. So in degree, minute, second form, 159.26 degrees is going to be 159 full degrees and then 15 minutes and then 36 seconds. So depending on the situation we're in, decimal degrees may be more helpful or potentially degree minute second form may be more helpful. It's just going to depend on the situation. So now let's talk about radians. Radians may be a new measure depending on what you have or have not seen before. So one radian is also going to be a measure of rotation. It represents the amount of rotation that we get if we were to place a circle's radius along its circumference, in other words, along its edge. Well, you may think, okay, well that represents a distance. If I take the radius and wrap it around the circle, then I've traveled a distance. What we're interested in is how much rotation is then associated with that distance that we've traveled. And as it turns out, the amount of a radian, depending on if you're thinking of it in terms of rotation, if you're thinking of a radian as representing how far we've rotated, it's actually independent of how big the radius is. So if you take a circle, imagine taking the radius and then wrapping that radius along the circumference. So taking this straight segment and then wrapping it along the curve. As it turns out, the distance or the amount of rotation you travel is actually independent of the circle's radius. So if this is what we think of as a small circle, it has a small radius, the actual distance we travel is really short. Imagine drawing a circle that was a lot larger than this. I mean, maybe a circle with a radius of a mile, a really, really large circle. If you were to take the radius of that circle and wrap it around the circumference of the circle, the distance traveled will be further. But if we think of it in terms of the, in terms of the amount of rotation from where the radius starts to where it ends, the amount of rotation will actually be the same. So because of that, radians are actually unitless. If we're talking about a circle whose radius and whose circumference is measured in inches, okay, 
if we're talking about one measured in miles or light years, even something like that, the, um, the description of what a radian is has nothing to do with what the actual circle's radius is. So a radian is unitless because a radian means the same thing regardless of how we're measuring the dimensions of our circle. So to understand what a radian is in terms of the amount of rotation that it represents, it's helpful to think in terms of circumference. So circumference in terms of the radius of a circle is given as 2 pi r. The 2 pi portion represents the rotational component of taking the circumference. So in other words, if you were to take the radius of the circle and wrap it around the circumference and then take that and do that two pi times, then you'll have covered the entire circle. Well, we know pi is roughly 3.14, so two times 3.14, let's call it roughly six. What that means is that if you were to take six radii and wrap them around the circle, then you would essentially complete the entire circumference. So if r is our radius, 2 pi represents the rotational component. It's the number of times we'd have to wrap that radius around the circle circumference in order to cover the whole circle. But again, regardless of how large or how small the circle is, and then how large or how small its radius is, we'd still have to take the same number of radii to wrap the entire circle. So this idea of needing 2 pi radii to wrap around the circle has nothing to do with how large or how small the circle is. So this is going to allow us to label key radian measures, this idea that there's 2 pi radians, 2 pi radius measures around the circle. That's going to allow us to find also a conversion between degrees and radians. So what is one radian? If we talk about one degree, one degree is one fraction out of 360. If we were to divide the circle into 360 even little portions all around, one of those portions is what we call a degree. Well, what is one radian? Well, if you imagine taking the radius of the circle and then molding it to fit the circumference, you'd end up about there, something like that. One radian, this is what we think of as one radian, one radius's distance along the circle, but not truly in terms of distance, in terms of how far we've rotated. One radius, or one radian, excuse me, is approximately 57.3 degrees. Now, again, that is an approximation. Approximations are not necessarily good enough for conversion, so we want exact measures. So first off, let's start with degrees. If we were to go around this whole circle, what are the key degree measures? Specifically, if we start along the positive x-axis, in other words, think of rotating from standard position, going counterclockwise, what are the key degree measures? Well, we know we would start at zero degrees if we haven't rotated anywhere. And if we rotate all the way around, because one degree is one 360th of the circle, then if we rotate all the way around, we've gone 360 degrees. Well, if we rotate half the way, we've rotated half of 360 degrees, which means we've rotated 180 degrees. If we rotate half of that amount, then half of 180 is going to be 90 degrees. And then if we rotate it 3 fourths of the way, then we've rotated 270 degrees. So those are gonna be all of our key degree measures as we rotate all the way from standard position along the positive x-axis back towards the same location. So in other words, if you let the initial side lay along here and then take that ray, rotate it all the way around so that it coincides with itself again, in other words, you trace the entire circle, then you've gone 360 degrees worth of rotation. What we're gonna find is the same kind of thing works with radians. So zero degrees and zero radians mean the same thing. So zero radians means we haven't rotated at all. If you take zero radiuses, radii, and wrap them along the circle, 
Well, you haven't gone anywhere. You're still right there. If you go all the way around, one radius takes you this far, two pi radii take you all the way from where you start back to where you started. So if you make it all the way around, this is going to be two pi radii. It takes two pi radiuses, radii, to make your way all the way around. So two pi radians represents full rotation all the way around the circle. Well, the same way we split up degrees, we can split up radians. If we wanna go halfway, if two pi is all the way, then halfway would be half of two pi, which would be pi radians. Well, if we wanna go a quarter of the way, we're going half of this distance, so a quarter of two pi, or half of pi, we could call pi over two radians. And so if this is zero pi's, and then pi over two, or pi, which we could also call two pi over two, then we have pi over two, two pi over two, three pi over two radians, and then four pi over two, otherwise known as two pi. So based on the fact that all of these degree measures and these radian measures represent the same amount of rotation, that's going to give us our conversion factors. So if we want to convert from degrees to radians, from degrees to radians, ultimately what we want to cancel is degrees. So remember, whenever you use a conversion factor, the unit you want to get rid of is going to be the unit you give in the denominator. So 360 degrees is equivalent to 2 pi radians. And as it turns out, I've written rad several times. That's the abbreviation for radians. Remember, I mentioned above, radians are unitless because regardless of how we're measuring the dimensions of the circle, the amount of rotation represented by a radian is going to be the same. So we don't want to think in terms of the actual radius. We just want to think of how many radii we would need to take to rotate around the circle. So radians are actually unitless. We don't actually have to write rad. So if we're talking about rotation and we don't write a degree symbol, then it's understood that the amount of rotation we're talking about is being given in radians. So if I just write two pi, no rad, it's understood that that's in terms of radians. So this is a conversion factor, but technically this can be reduced. You always wanna reduce fractions if you can. There's a common factor of two, which would reduce this to pi over 180 degrees. That is gonna be our conversion from degrees to radians. And then if we want to go in the opposite direction, if we have a measure in radians, and we want to convert to degrees, again, the idea is the unit we wanna get rid of is gonna be in the denominator of our conversion factor. So two pi in the denominator, two pi radians, is the same thing as 360 degrees. And again, if we reduce that common factor, that's going to give us a conversion factor of 180 degrees over pi. So anytime we want to convert from degrees to radians or from radians to degrees, we're going to use one of these two conversion factors. Now, this assumes for degrees that we're talking about decimal degrees. If we're talking about degrees, minutes, seconds, and we want to convert to radians, then first thing we'll have to do is convert degrees, minutes, seconds to decimal degrees, and then we can apply our conversion factor. But if you're really good with conversions and you know how to set up all those fractions and do those conversions that we just did, then you can actually do it all in one line and just simplify everything down multiply all the numerators, multiply all the denominators, and then just go from there. So let's look at a few examples. Okay, so we've got some degree measures, and we want to convert from degrees to radians. And then for the last two examples, we want to round to four decimal places. So radians, we don't really have a corresponding degree, minute, second kind of thing for radians. When we talk about radians, it's either going to be an exact radian measure 
or it's going to be a radian measure with some type of decimal attached to it. So first one, 240 degrees, we want to convert to radians. In other words, we want to eliminate degrees and write in terms of radians. So that means the conversion we're going to use is going to be pi divided by 180 degrees. Now simplifying these, you can do it in the calculator if you want. Simplify what you can as you go. So those zeros for sure will simplify. So that would leave us with 24 pi over 18. Degrees are gone, we're in terms of radians, but again, we don't need to write rad. It's understood now that this is in terms of radians. 24 and 18, well those can also reduce by two, or if we wanted to go one step further, what are they also divisible by? They're also both divisible by six. So if we divide out that common factor of six, that's gonna leave us with four pi in the numerator, and then six goes into 18 three times. So our radian measure corresponding to 240 degrees is going to be four pi over three. Now, if we have a negative degree that means we're going clockwise, so counterclockwise. Let me go back and label that. That's worth going back and labeling. If we look at our circle here, if we're going in the counterclockwise direction, that's going to be positive rotation. And if we're going in the clockwise direction, that's going to be negative rotation. So say we were to go this direction and end right here, that's gonna be 90 positive degrees. If we were to rotate all the way around here, that'd be 270. Well, say we rotated to this location, but we went in the opposite direction. We would call that negative 90 degrees. So the amount of rotation is the same as rotating to 90 degrees, but we're just rotating in the opposite direction. So just keep in mind, positive means counterclockwise, going upwards, and then negative means clockwise going downwards. So let's go back to that. Okay, so negative 195 degrees. In other words, the amount is 195 degrees, but we're rotating clockwise instead of counterclockwise. Again, we want to convert from degrees to radians. So we want to keep radians. We want to eliminate degrees. We, elim we eliminate on that diagonal. Now don't forget your negative. When you convert two radians, a negative angle measure is a negative angle measure. So negative degrees are also going to be negative radians. So negative 195 pi over 180. Well, what could these two reduce by? Well, I don't necessarily see their greatest common factor, but I know for sure they could both be reduced by five. So 195 divided by five would give us a numerator of 39. So that could be 39 pi in the numerator. And then 180 divided by five is going to be 36. Okay, can we go any further? Is there anything else that these two have in common? Well, 39 and 36 also have a common factor of three. So let's see where that takes us. So 39 divided by three would give us 13 and then 36 divided by three would give us 12. So that's gonna be negative 13 pi divided by 12. And since 13 and 12 only have a common factor of one, that means we're fully reduced and that's gonna be our simplified radian measure. Now for these last two, we're going to convert but because we don't have nice, clean angle measures in degrees, when we convert, we're going to write radians with a decimal. The conversion factors are always going to be the same though. So 64.6 degrees converted to radians. We wanna keep radians, we want to eliminate degrees. Now here we can just do this in the calculator. Now because we're going to decimal, we can also plug in pi and just multiply by pi. Notice these two first examples, we kept pi. If we'd multiplied by four and pi and then divided by three, pi is an irrational number, which means anything past this, anything past four pi over three 
or negative 13 pi over 12 would ultimately have just been an approximation. And the idea is we want to keep exact answers whenever we can. Here we've been told that we can round at the very end, so we can actually multiply by pi, and we don't have to leave the final answer in terms of pi. So we're going to take 64.6 multiply by pi. Now don't type 3.14. If you notice on your calculator right above the exponent button in blue there's a little pi symbol. This is where you're going to get pi for all of these conversions. So it's in blue so you're going to hit second and then the up arrow and that's going to type in a non-approximated version of pi. And then all of that is going to be divided by 184, 180 degrees and that's going to give us our radian measure. Now we want to convert to four decimal places, so that's going to be 1.1278. 1 radians approximately. And then one final example. For this last one, we don't have decimal degrees. Now all of these conversions we use take us from degrees to radians, radians to degrees, but the assumption is that we're talking about decimal degrees, not degrees, minutes, and seconds. So if we're in degree, minute, second form, first thing we need to do is convert to decimal degrees, and then we can convert to radians. So let's take this and let's convert this to decimal degrees. So 12 degrees in full, so we'll keep that. We'll keep our 12 degrees. Now we have six minutes. So six minutes, and we want to convert from minutes to degrees. So there is one degree for every 60 minutes. So when we multiply and then divide, six times one is gonna give us six and then we're dividing by 60, and that's going to give us 0 0.1 degrees. So that's then going to be added to our 12 full degrees. Now we also have 36 seconds, and again we want to convert to degrees, so we can either go directly to degrees or go to minutes and then go to degrees. So I'm going to go to minutes first. So there's one minute for every 60 seconds and then there's one degree for every 60 minutes. And so the two units we don't want are going to cancel diagonally and we're going to be left with our degrees. So what do we have in the numerator? Well we have 36 all the way across in the numerator and then in the denominator 60 times 60 is going to be 3600, so that'll be the number of degrees we have. So 36 divided by 3600 is going to be 0 0.01, and don't forget your degree symbol. So degrees, minutes, seconds converted to decimal degrees. We have 12 full degrees, and then a tenth of degree, and a one hundredth of degree. So point one one degrees. Just add those on to the 12 full degrees. Now we're right where we were for the previous one. We can apply our conversion factor going from degrees to radians. So we want radians. So pi radians for every 180 degrees. And then we're going to round to four decimal places. So 12.11 degrees times pi, so second up arrow gives us pi, divided by 180 representing degrees. So to four decimal places, 0 0.2114. 0 0.2114. That will be our radian measure. Okay, so let's do the conversions backwards. Instead of starting with degrees and going to radians, what if we have radians and we want to convert to degrees? Same idea. So pi over 12. Now how do we know if we're starting with degrees or radians? Suppose we aren't told how the, the conversion is going to go, what measure we're starting with. You have to base it on the notation. So notice for all four of these 
we had the actual degree symbol and then the last one we had degrees, minutes, seconds. If you have the degree symbol, you assume it's in degrees. If you don't, if you don't see any notation, but you know you're referencing something related to rotation, you know it has to be in radians. So if you want to indicate that you're in degrees, you need to have the degree symbol. If it's in radians, then there won't be any symbol involved. So now we've got radians, we want to go two degrees. So we want to keep degrees and cancel out, eliminate radians. So keep degrees, which means the degree measures in the numerator, and we're eliminating radians, so we're dividing by the corresponding angle measure in radians. Now notice what happens here. Because the radian measure we have is in terms of pi, we now have a common factor of pi that divides out, and so we're just left with 180 over 12 degrees. And so we can put that into the calculator. So 180 divided by 12 is going to give us 15. So that will be 15 degrees. So pi over 12 radians accounts for the same amount of rotation as 15 degrees. Now same thing with negative degrees. If we have negative radians, when we convert it, the degree measure will also be negative. Negative radians just means we're also rotating clockwise but now we're rotating um, an amount in terms of radians rather than an amount in terms of degrees. Now same conversion factor, we want to keep degrees, we want to eliminate radians. So 180 degrees divided by pi radians. Again, we have that common factor of pi. And so in the numerator, we're left with three and 180. In the denominator, we're left with eight. And so again, we can do that all in one step if we want. Notice it's gonna be negative. So three times 180 in the numerator, three times 180, and then we're dividing by eight in the denominator. And that's gonna give us 67.5. Okay, so what that means now is we can't go all the way just doing that. We're actually gonna have some fractional degree measure left. So let's see what actually happens. We want to get this exact, okay. <clears throat> so, well, but you know what, if we want to convert to degrees and we're not rounding, we're still just going to say 67.5. Let's just leave it like that. This is exact since we are talking about an exact measure that wasn't rounded. So we can go, we can go that direction, okay. Now, for the last one, negative 2.7, what I want you to notice here is this is not in terms of pi. You're going to get used to seeing pi anytime you see radian measures, but I don't want you to assume that just because you see pi, you're talking about radians. It all has to do with notation. If there's a degree symbol, we're talking about degrees. If there's no degree symbol, we're talking about radians. But what you're gonna find is that if we're talking about radians, and we don't have it in terms of pi, that means the conversion is not going to be a pretty conversion. It means we're gonna to have to do some rounding because we're not gonna be able to cancel that common factor of pi. There is no factor of pi. So we'll use the same conversion factor, but anything we want to do at that point is then going to involve some kind of approximation. And in this case, we just wanna round our final answer to four decimal places. Okay, so this will be approximated. Again, we have a negative measure. That's gonna be consistent regardless of our representation. And then we can just multiply straight across and then divide. So 2.7 times 180 degrees divided by pi. And that's going to give us negative 154.69 eight, six, and this is degrees. So that is our approximate degree measure. So after a while, you'll start to have a better sense of what radian measure looks like. Ultimately, we're never going to write one radian as approximately 57.3 degrees. It's helpful to think of it that way in terms of just visualizing what a radian looks like. Once you use radians more, you'll have a better sense of visualizing what radian measures look like. 
but for now, in order to understand what one particular radian measure is describing in terms of rotation, it may be helpful to convert degrees. You can probably visualize what 15 degrees looks like or what negative 155, roughly, degrees looks like, even if you can't picture what the radian measures look like at the moment. So that's going to be one benefit of converting from radians to degrees, at least for the time being. So let's switch gears a little bit. We know now about our different angle measures. We know how to convert to different forms depending upon the situation we're in. Now we're going to talk about something called a co-terminal angle or a pair of co-terminal angles. So two angles are said to be co-terminal, co meaning shared, and terminal, think of the terminal side. Co-terminal angles have the same initial and terminal side. So in other words, if you're in the coordinate plane and you graph them, they look the same for all intents and purposes, except that one differs only by full rotations. If they look the same, if they start at the same location, and they end at the same location, but somehow they're not the same angle. They don't have the same angle measure. Well, the only way they can start and end at the same location is if one is represented as the other with some additional rotation or rotations added on. So coterminal angles are just angles that are going to look the same. If you graph them without knowing how much rotation additionally is involved, if you just graph them, they look exactly the same in the coordinate plane, but they have different measures, meaning that one of the terminal sides was rotated around maybe one or two more times in either the positive direction or in the negative direction. So any particular angle we're given has infinitely many angles that are co-terminal to it. Any additional rotation you perform, it has to be a full rotation, any additional full rotation you perform is going to take the angle you're given and give you a new angle that's coterminal to it. Well, you can keep rotating indefinitely, forever and ever, in either directions, which means there are going to be infinitely many angles that are coterminal to any other angle you're given. So suppose you want to find angles that are coterminal to whatever angle you're given. What you're going to do is use this idea of how they differ, the fact that they differ by full rotations. So to find a coterminal angle, an angle that's coterminal to one that you're given, you're going to add or subtract multiples of full rotation in terms of degrees, which would be 360 degrees, or if we have an angle in radians, full rotation is represented as two pi radians. So let's do a few examples. We've been given an angle, either in degrees or in radians, and we want to find a positive angle and a negative angle that would be coterminal to this angle represented as theta. So we haven't used this symbol yet. This is the Greek letter theta. We're going to use a lot of Greek letters throughout the course. Theta is going to be one of them. So representing angles is often represented using the symbol theta. So it's like drawing a zero and then just draw um, a horizontal line through it. This is the Greek letter theta. And this is how you spell it. Once we encounter others, um, I'll make sure to write out what the name is and then so on and so forth. So it's just a, it looks like a zero and then just draw a line through the middle of it. That's gonna be the Greek letter theta. Okay, so first angle measure, theta, is 960 degrees. So we want to find a positive angle and a negative angle that are coterminal to this angle, theta. In other words, if we were to graph 960 degrees and we know what it looks like, give another angle that has another angle measure that looks the same as 960 degrees, that starts and ends at the same location in the coordinate plane. Okay. Well, to find a positive angle that's coterminal, either we could find an angle that's bigger, which means we've added on a rotation, or because this is such a large angle, if we were to subtract a rotation, we'd still have another positive angle that's coterminal to theta. Now, to find a negative angle that's coterminal, 
because this is positive, if we want to find a negative angle that's coterminal, we have to subtract rotations, which again means going in the clockwise direction away from this angle. So let's just do subtraction. So 960 degrees, suppose we want to find a positive angle that's coterminal to this. Well, one possibility is maybe it's a positive angle, but it's one fewer rotation. So if we were to take our angle and subtract 360 degrees, then we'd end up in the same location in terms of the terminal side, but we're just one rotation fewer than we had represented at 960 degrees. So 960 minus 360 minus one full rotation would give us 600 degrees. So in other words, if you were to graph 960 degrees in standard position and you were to graph 600 degrees in standard position, they're going to look exactly the same because they differ only by a full rotation around the circle. Now if we want a negative angle that's coterminal to this angle, then we need to keep rotating. So the idea is here is say this is negative nine or say this is 960 degrees. We rotated around one time in the negative direction and that took us to 600 degrees. We have to keep rotating additional full rotations in order to find a negative angle that's coterminal. Well, how many times do we have to rotate to get to a negative angle? Sometimes that's just going to take trial and error. So let's just use the calculator to determine. So if we rotate backwards one time, it takes us to 600. Well, what if we rotate back again, subtract another 360? Well, that's going to take us to 240. So 240 is another angle that is coterminal with 960 degrees. It's still not negative though, so we need to keep going. So if we subtract another 360, that's going to take us to negative 120 degrees. So if we were to take 600 degrees, which is coterminal, and then from that subtract two additional 360 degree rotations. So from there, if we were to subtract two additional full rotations, that would take us to negative 120 degrees, which is also coterminal to 960 degrees. So again, the idea is if you graph 960 degrees in standard position, graph 600 degrees in standard position, and then also graph negative 120 degrees in standard position, they look exactly the same. So unless you've indicated how far you've rotated, how many times you've rotated around the circle to get to that particular angle, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between those three. And what we're going to find is we look further at angles and we use angles in our trigonometry problems, what we're going to find is if we can make determinations about what happens for 960 degrees in a specific context, then the same things are going to happen for 600 degrees, the same things are going to happen for negative 120 degrees, and then also for 240, which was a coterminal angle in between them. So the fact that these are coterminal angles means they have a lot in common is one thing that's going to be important to note. Now, what if we have theta as negative 225 degrees? In other words, we're starting with a negative angle. Well, if we want a positive and a negative angle coterminal to theta, a positive angle means we'd have to take negative 225 and rotate in the positive direction. So if we were to take this angle measure and add a full rotation in the positive direction, then that should take us to a positive coterminal angle. So negative 225 degrees plus a full rotation. Let's see what that gives us. So negative 225 degrees, and we're going to add on a full rotation. Rotate one time in the positive direction. That's going to give us 135 degrees. So that would be a positive angle that's coterminal with negative 225. They look the same except for this full rotation by which they differ. Now if we want a negative angle coterminal to negative 225, that means we'd have to continue rotating in the negative direction. So if we were to subtract a full rotation, in other words, as opposed to rotating counterclockwise in the positive direction, imagine rotating once in the 
negative direction. That's what we're doing right here. That will give us a negative coterminal angle. So negative 225 minus 360 is going to give us negative 585 degrees. So again, if we graph this angle, and then this angle, and then this angle as well, they'll look the same except for the fact that they differ by some combination of full rotations either in the positive direction or in the negative direction. Now what if we're talking about radian measures? What if we have an angle given in radians? Same idea, the idea of what a coterminal angle is, what it means is the same. But now, if we're rotating, it's no longer going to be rec um, represented as 360 degrees. It's going to be represented as 2 pi radians. So full rotations will either add on 2 pi or we'll subtract 2 pi to get to a coterminal angle. So suppose we start with negative 5 pi over 6. So that's an angle rotated in the clockwise direction. If we want a positive coterminal angle, we're going to have to add a positive rotation in the positive direction. So if we take negative 5 pi over 6 and add 2 pi, this will give us a positive coterminal angle. Now this is slightly more complicated. We want exact angles, which means we need to get a common denominator in order to be able to add here. So negative 5 pi over 6 plus 2 pi, well 2 pi with a denominator of 6, could be written as 12 pi over 6. And now we can combine over that common denominator of 6. So combining together, that would give us 7 pi over 6. So that is a positive coterminal angle with the angle negative 5 pi over 6. Now what if we want a negative coterminal angle? Same idea, but now we are subtracting 2 pi, rotating in the clockwise direction. So again, common denominator, so negative 5 pi over 6 minus 12 pi over 6. So negative 5 pi minus 12 pi is going to give us negative 17 pi over 6. And that would be our negative coterminal angle. And then last but not least, 13 pi over 2. If we want a positive coterminal angle we could add on. If we want a negative coterminal angle we're going to have to subtract, go in the negative direction, go in the clockwise direction. Now 13 pi over 2, it may not look like it but it's actually a fairly large angle. 13 pi over 2 has taken 2 pi and we've gone around several several times. So we could also subtract 2 pi one time and still have a positive angle. So if I subtract 2 pi, well that's going to be the same thing as, remember, in this case we have a denominator of 2, so 2 pi with a denominator of 2 would become 4 pi over 2, so minus 4 pi over 2. That would give us 13 pi minus 4 pi, which is 9 pi over 2. So that would be a positive coterminal angle. Well, if we want to keep going, we need to find a negative coterminal angle. How many additional times are we going to have to rotate around? Well, let's see. Well, we need to continue subtracting multiples of 2 pi, or alternatively, 4 pi over 2. So minus 4 pi over 2. What would that take us to? That would take us to 5 pi over 2, which is still positive. So minus another pi over 4 pi over 2. So that's 8 pi over 2 in total. So 9 pi over 2 minus 8 pi over 2, still a positive angle. So what if we subtracted another? That should take us to a negative angle. So in total, that's going to be 12 pi over 2. So 9 pi over 2 minus 12 pi over 2 is going to be negative 3 pi over 2. And that would be our negative coterminal angle. So what actually happened right here? Well, right here we ended up subtracting 3 times 2 pi. In other words, we rotated in the negative direction 3 additional full rotations, and that takes us from this one positive coterminal angle to the first negative coterminal angle. 
Now one thing to keep in mind is if we're looking for coterminal angles, the answer you come up with for a coterminal angle is not necessarily unique. If the directions are just find a positive and negative coterminal angle, well you have a lot of options. So for instance, for this last one we did, 9 pi over 2 is a positive angle that's coterminal with 13 pi over 2. But alternatively, if we added on a rotation, we would have a bigger angle that's also coterminal. Or if we'd subtracted another one, that would take us to 5 pi over 2, also coterminal. And then so on and so forth, same thing with the negative angles. We could keep going, we could rotate even further. That would take us to another negative coterminal angle. So coterminal angles, remember there's infinitely many because we can rotate as many times as we want and continue finding angles that are coterminal with whichever one we're given. So there will be different answers potentially when we're talking about finding coterminal angles. Now when we actually use this in the context of trigonometry, typically we're going to want a specific coterminal angle based on the angle we're given. So in many cases we're specifically interested in finding coterminal angles within the first rotation about the coordinate plane. In other words, something between 0 degrees and 360 degrees, if we're talking about degrees, or between 0 and 2 pi radians. Those will be the angles we're typically interested in when we're talking about finding a coterminal angle. So if we have an angle that represents rotation outside of this first rotation from 0 to 360 or 0 to 2 pi radians, then we'll be looking for the specific coterminal angle within those bounds um, that's going to be coterminal to the angle we're given. So suppose we have 1521 degrees. We want to find the angle, not an angle, but the angle coterminal to this between 0 and 360 degrees. What we're going to find is that if we want to find an angle within a specific range of values, particularly in this case, there's only going to be one. So the angle coterminal to this particular angle within this range is going to be unique. There's only going to be one. And it may take some trial and error to figure out how far you have to rotate to get back to this range of values. So this is a great time to just use your calculator. So 1521, what happens if we rotate backwards one time? Okay, so we're going in the negative direction in order to get to some smaller coterminal angles. Well that's still not far enough, so what if we subtract another 360? So let's keep track. This is going to be our second subtraction. Doesn't take us there yet, so minus 360, third subtraction. Still not quite there. Minus 360, fourth subtraction, and that takes us to the range between 0 and 360 degrees. So if we were to take this angle and subtract 360 degrees four times, that's going to be sufficient to take us to the range that we want. And that's going to give us 81 degrees. So 81 degrees will be the unique coterminal angle to 1521 that's between 0 and 360 degrees. Now if we have a negative angle, we're going to have to add rotations. So negative 603, we want to go in the positive direction. So plus 360, that's one addition, not quite there, plus another 360, that now takes us into the range we want. So two additions of 360 degrees will take us within this range from 0 to 360. And that's going to give us 117 degrees. Now what if we have radians? Same general idea. The only thing that becomes a little bit more complicated is knowing whether or not you're in the correct interval from 0 to 2 pi. So we'll talk about that in a minute. How do we make that determination? So 17 pi over 4 is beyond 0 and 2 pi in the positive direction. So we know we're going to have to subtract to get back to this particular range of values to find the coterminal angle within that interval. So 
so we're subtracting multiples of 2 pi. Now we're going to have to do this by hand because we're going to have to get a common denominator. So say I subtract just a single 2 pi. Well, I want to combine with something that has a denominator of 4, so I'm going to have to rewrite that with a common denominator. So 17 pi over 4, and then 2 pi can be rewritten as 8 pi over 4. So 17 pi minus 8 pi is going to give us 9 pi over 4. Now, is that within the interval that we want? How do we know? What I want you to focus on is the coefficient here. We could think of this as 9 pi over 4, or we could think of this as 9 fourths pi. Well, what is 9 fourths as a decimal? Let's see, 9 divided by 4 is 2.25. How does this help us? Well, think about what this interval represents. It's 0 to 2 pi, but another way to write this would be 0 pi to 2 pi. If we're thinking in terms of an amount of pies, a number of pies, we want something that's between zero pies and two pies. Well, the angle we have right here is equivalent to 2.25 pies, which is beyond where we want to be. So that's our indication that we haven't rotated far enough, that we need to rotate some additional amount. So I need to subtract another 2 pi, aka another 8 pi over 4. So let's subtract that. So 9 pi minus 8 pi is going to give me a single pi divided by 4. So we could think of this as pi over 4, or alternatively you could think of it as 1 fourth pi. We know 1 fourth is between 0 and 2, so we have the number of pi's we want. So pi over 4 is going to be the coterminal angle to 17 pi over 4 within this particular interval that we want. And now let's try one more. So negative 7 pi over 18 is a negative angle. If we want to get to this range of positive angles, we know we're going to have to add. So I'm going to add on 2 pi. Now again, we need our common denominator. So if we have a denominator of 18, this is going to become 36 pi over 18. So negative 7 pi over 18 plus 36 pi over 18. So negative 7 plus 36, just to be sure, 29. Now keep in mind, that's going to take us to 29 pi over 18. Let's see what that is. 29 pi over 18. Is that where we want to be? Well, it's positive. In theory, we should be in this range, but let's verify. 29 divided by 18, what's the coefficient on pi now? 25 divided by 18. That's going to be 1.61 pi. Well, we want to be between 0 pi's and 2 pi's. We're at about 1.6 pi's, so that means we're in the correct range at this point. So notice with this particular first angle, 17 pi over 4, we rotated one time and then a second time to get back to our coterminal angle, to the one we wanted. With this particular angle, we only had to rotate one time. So it's going to depend on how positive or how negative your angle is to start with, how many times you're going to have to rotate. So ultimately you keep going until the coefficient on pi is between 0 and 2. Once you have a coefficient on pi that's between 0 and 2, that means you've rotated into the correct interval and you've found your coterminal angle that you want. So again, the general idea with a coterminal angle is that it's going to look the same as the angle you're given. So 1,521 degrees and 81 degrees look the same except for additional rotations taken to get from this angle to this angle. But if you couldn't see those rotations, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And also, anything we know about 81 degrees or anything we can determine about 81 degrees is, for all intents and purposes, going to be the same as what we can determine for 1,521 degrees because, aside from those rotations, they look the same. They start at the same location, they end at the same location, and those additional rotations in the middle ultimately don't make a difference about where we start and where we end. 
So we're going to use coterminal angles a lot specifically to take angles like this that are within that first rotation and use them, extrapolate what we know about them to make determinations about what's going to happen for these other angles. So let's look at a couple applications for angle measure, specifically situations where being able to convert to radians, being able to use radians rather than degrees is going to be very helpful. So we're going to talk about a couple of different um, measurements that we can take for a circle using the fact that we now know what a radian is and how radians relate to distance. Radians are important because they help us relate rotation and distance. When we travel one radian, not only does a radian represent an amount of rotation, but since it's essentially a radius placed along the circumference of the circle, it also represents a particular distance traveled along the circumference of the circle. So whereas degrees only represent rotation, a radian is kind of a, a hybrid between rotation and distance. We can relate distance to rotation when we use radians because radians are kind of a fusion of those two um, different measures. So one particular calculation we can make using radians, specifically angles in radians, is what we call arc length. So given a circle of radius r, the length of an arc, we're going to call this length s, the length of an arc intercepted by a central angle, okay, that's a lot, what does that all mean? Central angle specifically in radians is given by the following formula. And we're actually going to derive this. I don't want to write this out yet, but we'll derive what it's going to be. Let me draw a picture. So here's our center, okay, here's our radius. An arc, when we're talking about an arc, we're talking about some portion of the circle that we've traveled based on the fact that we've traveled a certain amount in terms of rotation. So if we rotate around a certain amount, the arc length is how far in terms of distance that we've traveled on the circle. So say this is how far we've rotated. In other words, say this is theta. The distance we've traveled along the circumference of the circle is what we call arc length. So this we're going to label as S. So the question is, if we rotate this far, well, how far in terms of a distance have we traveled along the circle? Now because we're traveling along the edge of the circle, arc length is going to be very closely related to circumference. Okay, so suppose our angle measure is given in radians. Well let's think about the circumference of the circle. We know the circumference of the circle is always given as 2 times pi times r. So if we were to start here and travel all the way around, back to where we started, then we've traveled 2 pi r, whatever that is, based upon the r that we have. Well, we've only traveled some fraction of that. That fraction is represented by how much rotation we've taken, starting from the initial side of this angle and then rotating to the terminal side of this angle. We've traveled some fraction of the full rotation. Well, what is that fraction of the full rotation? Well, because we're talking about radians, we can relate the amount of rotation to the idea that distance and rotation are similar when we're talking about radians. So if we went all the way around, in radians we would have gone 2 pi radians. Now we've only gone pi, um, theta radians. We don't know what theta is, but we've gone theta radians. So the fraction of the circle we've gone is going to be theta divided by 2 pi. That's the fraction of the circumference we've covered. So if this is the full circumference, this is the fraction of it that we've actually traveled by taking this amount of rotation and then measuring the arc that we drew as we rotate it. Well, notice what happens when we have this particular fraction here. We now have a common factor of 2 pi, which means that factor is going to be eliminated. And all we're going to be left with is our times theta. So the arc length, the actual distance we've traveled along the circumference of the circle, along the edge of the circle, is going to be r, our radius, times theta. Notice this was very much dependent on the fact that theta was in radians. 
Because theta was in radians, we were able to write this particular ratio representing the fraction of the circumference that we've traveled. If theta was in degrees, it would be theta over 360, and nothing would cancel. It wouldn't simplify down the way it has here. So having theta in radians is absolutely crucial. So what that means is if we're trying to take an arc length, if we want to take that measurement and we're given an angle measure in degrees, then we're going to have to start by converting to radians. This particular formula is only going to work if we're in radians, so having an angle in radians is going to be crucial to start with. So let's do an example. We want to find the length of the arc made by an angle of 105 degrees on a circle that has a radius of 15 centimeters. And we want to give the exact arc length and then also a rounded version where we rounded to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. Okay, so let's draw a picture. That might be helpful. Okay, so here's my center and we have a radius of 15 centimeters. So here's 15 centimeters. And then from wherever we started, we've made an angle of 105 degrees. So if we went one quarter of the way, we'd be at 90. So 105 degrees is maybe somewhere around there. That's the amount of rotation we've made. So that's gonna be 105 degrees. And the question is, how long is the arc that we've made by rotating 105 degrees from the initial to the terminal side of this angle in this um, circle that has a 15 centimeter radius? Well, we're gonna use our arc length formula, which we just derived up here, but because our angle is in degrees, the first thing we need to do is convert it to radians before we can use that formula. So we have 105 degrees and we want to convert to radians. So we want to keep radians. We want to eliminate degrees. So that's going to be our conversion factor. Now we're going to keep this exact. We're going to reduce this as far as it can go, but we want to keep it in terms of pi so that it is an exact number. So we have a common factor of five, if nothing else. So let's see if we can reduce this. So 105 over five, that's gonna to reduce to 21. And then 180 divided by five is gonna to reduce to 36. Well, do they have an additional common factor? Well, 21 is also divisible by three. 36 is also divisible by three. So let's go one step further. So 21 over three will reduce to seven. 36 over 3 will reduce to 12. So fully reduced, the radian measure is going to be 7 pi over 12. So 105 degrees of rotation is the same thing as 7 pi over 12 radians worth of rotation. Now that we have our angle in terms of radians, we can find our arc length. So S is going to be our radius, which is 15 centimeters. Make sure you keep those units. So 15 centimeters times theta, which is seven pi over 12 in radians. Now this is a moment where it becomes important that radians are unitless. As you do these kinds of problems in terms of actual physical units, all the units go through the problem. So if you have two types of units that are multiplied together, where the constants are multiplied together, the units are multiplied together as well. Well, because a radian is actually unitless, ultimately it just takes on the unit associated with the other measurements in the problem. So in this case, our final answer is going to be in terms of centimeters, because the radius is in terms of centimeters, and the angle in radians is actually unitless. So let's simplify this down now. So 15 and 12, do they have any common factors? Well, they have a common factor of three. So let's reduce that here. So three goes into 15 five times, three goes into 12 four times. And so five times seven is gonna be 35. So 35 pi. And then our denominator is going to be four. So the exact arc length is gonna be 35 pi over four centimeters. That's the exact arc length. So if we were to measure this distance, that's 35 pi over four centimeters. Now, if we want the approximation, then we can go through and we can put that into the calculator. So 35 times 
pi divided by four is going to be 27 point, let's see, and we want the nearest tenth of a centimeter, so 27.5 centimeters. And here we go, that's gonna be the amount that we travel. Okay, so we can measure the length of an arc based on the fact that our angle is in radians. We can also measure the area of a sector, which is also closely related. So instead of measuring how far we've traveled along the edge of the circle, imagine taking the area of the actual section that you've pulled out based on traveling that far. That's the general idea of what we get with a sector. So the area of a sector of a circle that has radius r and a central angle theta, again in radians, is given by the following. And let's derive it again. So here we go, if this is r, and we've traveled around some amount that we're calling theta. Well, then the question is, what is the area of that entire region? That's what we're looking for. Well, we can approach finding this formula the same way we approached finding this one. We took the whole circumference, which was two pi r, and then took the fraction of that circumference represented by this particular section noticing that radians would be theta, this portion, divided by the whole radian measure around the circle, which would be two pi. So this was the fraction of the circle that we traveled based on the fact that we traveled theta radians. Same kind of thing here, but now instead of breaking down the circumference, we're breaking down the area of the circle. So what's the formula for the area of the circle? Well, it's going to be pi times r squared. So pi r squared is the area. And again, if that's the area of the whole circle, we only want this fraction. And in terms of radians, we've traveled theta radians out of the two pi represented by the whole circle. So theta divided by two pi. Well, when we looked at arc length, two pi, that whole factor canceled. Well, here we can't cancel the two, but notice we have a common factor of pi. So we're left with an r squared, we're left with a theta, and then a two in the denominator. Another way to write two in the denominator is to write a one half. So dividing by two is the same thing as multiplying by one half. And then we're left with r squared and theta. So that is going to be the area of that small sector, that little section of the circle. One half times r squared times theta, again, theta in radians, very important. So let's look at this one final example. So a crop sprinkler rotates through an angle of 150 degrees and it sprays water a distance of 90 feet. Find the amount of area watered rounded to the nearest whole unit. So again, let's draw a picture, always a good idea if you can. So here's the center. So the idea is we have a sprinkler Okay, right here it sprays water out covering this whole distance, which is 90 feet. So it covers all the distance from where it starts out 90 feet and the sprinkler head rotates around an angle of 150 degrees, which might be something like that. So that angle is 150 degrees. And the question is what area does this sprinkler um, spray to water onto, what area does it water, based on the fact that it goes out 90 feet and then is able to rotate 150 degrees from where it's originally pointed. Okay, so we're gonna use our area formula. Again, we're taking the area of the whole circle and then we're taking the fraction associated with that particular amount of rotation, 150 out of the total 360. But in order to use our area formula, first thing we need to do is convert our degree measure to a radian measure. So 150 degrees times our conversion factor, pi over 180. Our zeros clearly cancel. And then we have a common factor of three associated with each of these leftovers, 15 and 18. So three goes into 15 five times. And then three goes in 18 six times. So 150 degrees in radians would be five pi over six 
radians. So that's going to be the value for theta that we use. And then r is 90 feet. So our area is going to be 1 half times our radius squared. Now again, make sure you take the units with you because not only are we squaring the radius value, but we also square the units. Area is in square units. So because our radius is measured in feet, the area will be measured in square feet. And then we're also multiplying by the radian measure of our central angle, which is five pi over six. So you can reduce things that have common factors if you want. You can multiply numerators and denominators straight across. First thing you have to do though for sure is you have to square 90 feet. Make sure you do that first before you do anything else. So 1 half and then 90 feet squared. Well 9 squared would be 81. So 90 squared would be 8100 and now it's feet squared and then that is multiplied by 5 pi over 6 and so let's maybe take an additional step and just multiply everything in the numerators and then multiply everything in the denominators so 8100 in the numerator times 5 so that's going to be 40,500 pi and then in the denominator, we have a 2 and we have a 6, and that's going to give us 12, and we are in square feet. So we could reduce this, and that would give us the exact area, but notice we're just going to round. So we're going to round to the nearest whole unit, so we can plug this in, plugging in pi, and then simplify and approximate. So 40,500 times pi, and then we're dividing the result by 12. And so to the nearest unit, since we have eight in the tenths place, we're going to round up. So that's going to be approximately 10,603 square feet. That is gonna be the area of our sector. So just to recap what we've looked at, we've looked at a lot of different topics. We've talked about our different angle measures Degrees, again, something you're used to. We talked about degrees, minutes, seconds, a way to look at fractional degrees. And then we also introduced the concept of a radian, which is going to take ro rotation and relate it closely to the distance you can travel around a circle. So we know how to convert from degrees to radians, from radians to degrees. We talked a little bit about coterminal angles, in other words, angles that start and end in the same locations and then just differ by full rotations. We'll use coterminal angles a lot during our discussion of trigonometry. And now we have a couple of applications where being able to convert to radian measures is going to be important, again, because of this idea that radians relate closely to both rotation and to distance traveled.